July in Canberra. It can be bitterly cold, frosty and foggy, but for over 400 delegates who recently descended on the capital for the annual Primary Healthcare Research Conference, the experience was invigorating and enlightening. The theme of the conference was Inform, Influence and Implement, Research Improving Policy and Practice. With such a theme, this conference was a powerhouse of knowledge exchange. For the three days, it was indeed a pivotal workplace in primary healthcare research. People came as delegates from many different organisational and professional perspectives. They brought their perspectives as consumers, researchers, policy makers, all different, but all sharing one very common thread, an interest in how they could contribute to improvements in primary healthcare research and primary healthcare outcomes. The contextualised conversations, held not only during the sessions, but in the corridors and in the coffee breaks, were invaluable. A knowledge exchange highlight of this conference was our session 2020. We asked our delegates and our panellists to look into the year 2020 using their 2020 foresight with a little bit of 2020 hindsight to consider the opportunity that health reform offers for them, for their research and their practice. The panellists raised some questions, threw us some opportunities and offered us some challenges. They believe that we need to think very differently about how we conduct our research and deliver care in a financially challenged future. They acknowledge that we have a major task in terms of quality of care for our most vulnerable people. People with complex needs, people with multi-morbidity, people with mental health issues, people dealing with the results of polypharmacy. The question was raised as to whether, or not, our current model of primary and secondary care will still be fit for purpose in the future, whether we need to uncouple the hospital specialists and have them working alongside community-based specialists. In this short introductory extract, let's hear what our panellists had to say. My name's Sally Coburn, I'm a GP from Melbourne. Some of you tragically may know me better as Dr Feelgood from the radio, but I won't hold that against you and I won't tell anyone you were listening back in the 1990s. It's my absolute pleasure to be facilitator of this final session and I've got to say it's great to have so many of you here and thank you for coming. It is going to be a great session, but it'll only be a great session if you get involved and oh boy are there many ways for you to get involved. I, I hate it when you go to a conference and you have to sit there and the last session you're really enthused and then you just sort of die at the end and just want to go home. Well, you're going to be reinvigorated and go home with some really strong messages. I want you to participate, and as I said, many ways. If you've got a mobile phone that's got some really special bits on it, more than just a, um, a camera, you'll find a, one of these barcode -y things. Um, you should already have downloaded the app. If you haven't, then you can't use this. But it's OK, because on this piece of paper, you can use a pen <laughs> and write questions. Of course, you can use a microphone, but I am a radio person and I just want to sort of start a new trend here. Um, I think that we need a new, um, I'm going to patent this, we're going to call it the Gronometer. Now what the Gronometer is, is that when you ask questions, they must be questions. Policy statements, no. Nah. If you have asked your question already at this conference, I would ask the rest of the audience, Gronometer time. <laughs> if you've heard it before, groan. You will know whether you should sit down and shut up. But we do want questions and we do want to know also what you um, think that you are going to change your practice, how you're going to change from what you've heard at this conference. Because we have Twitter. We've got the lot. Um, it's hashtag 2012PHCConf. And uh, we want your post-conference re uh, resolutions, uh, like a New Year's resolution, but these ones you're going to keep. And uh, we want to continue the conversation. That's the most important thing. So, in 1949... When George Elwell wrote his masterpiece, 1984 must have seemed like an eternity away. That's actually 28 years ago that 1984 happened. And it didn't happen quite the way George Orwell predicted, but some of the things he predicted did happen. Well, I'd just like to tell you that 2020 is just two federal elections away. Or well, it might be three the way we're going. <laughs> The WHO predicts that by 2020, mental health issues will be second, the second largest burden on the world health economy. IBIS market research predicts that the population of Australia will be 25.7 million uh, and that for every 1,000 people of working age, there will be 548 dependents. And while that might be down on the 635 in 1971, it's predicted that 45% of, of those dependents will be over 65. 
Current speculation based on obesity rates is that by 2020, one in three people will have diabetes. The question is, can we stop the express train of obesity leading to a cascade of chronic illnesses? Is zipping your cake hole and getting more exercise the answer? They say that communicable diseases are predicted to continue to decline with the rise of people living with chronic diseases. But at the same time, they're also telling us that we're going to have resistant organisms. Have we anticipated that? Are we asking the right questions? The 2020 summit, remember that, in 2008, some of you were probably there, published a graph and the per capita spend by country around the world on health and, uh, was, was listed. Australia spent less than 10% of its GDP on health and what percentage of that is on research? How do we get more money to do the research, to get the answers, to achieve better health outcomes for individuals and populations? Now, better health outcomes is often a hollow word, easy to say, but complex to actually achieve, but sometimes it's simple at the same time. It's not just about research, it's not just about practitioners, it's about the whole system and we need to look at it as a holistic approach. Health reform is a term we often associate with the system, but what's the system? The system is us. It's made up of people and we need to have the creativity to change. It's people like you, individuals who can make a difference individually and moreover collectively if we exchange ideas, if we collaborate. So let's use this session to explore the lessons of the past and find out ways of achieving the future we want for health. I want us to prove some of the doomsday prophets wrong. Then again, prior to 2008, no one thought that we might be able to prevent cervical cancer. And now Ian Fraser's work, it's likely that by 2020 our granddaughters may not need pap smears if they've been vaccinated. And as of this week, throat cancer and anal cancer may also take a dive, excuse the pun, for our grandsons. Thank you, I'm glad someone got that. And of course, who would have thought that three little words, slip, slop, slap, would literally change the face of Australians? So if we can achieve that, why can't we achieve the rest? But as I said, we need to be collaborative and creative and of course, evidence-based. So what are the barriers to achieving good health outcomes by 2020? What are the opportunities that we might miss if we don't act now? And how can we learn from the past to make it all happen? Well, first we're going to hear from our illustrious panel. You've met them all before or you've seen them or you've had a cup of tea with them, maybe drink at the bar, I won't answer. The bottom line is these people are going to tell you what they think are the lessons from the past, positive and negative, then over to you for input on how we can put this all together and make 2020 a landmark year, the year that we can celebrate our achievements in health outcomes and healthcare provision. Oh, that's right, I was also asked to predict what primary healthcare might look like then. Well, frankly, I think with the feminisation of the healthcare workforce, by 2020, we'll likely need quotas to encourage more males to get back into the primary healthcare service. On that note, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to invite to the microphone our fantastic uh, international guest, Dr Judith Smith. You'll all know her. Uh, she is the Head of Policy at the Nuffield Trust London. Judith, over to you. Thank you, Sally. I've got just three points uh, I want to make and I'm going to look forward. Um, and the first one for me, and this probably reflects um, the fact um, that I, I live and work in Europe, is that um, for me, the global economic context is absolutely predominant. And I think um, for our many, many of our health systems, and I guess in, in due course for Australia as well, we can't keep on spending more of our GDP on health. And certainly in many countries in the next while, we're going to have flat or reduced funding. And I think that, so that's for me absolutely critical context. And it's very different context for a lot of us when we've got used to increasing wealth year on year. Secondly, for me, the other really important driver for health organisation and policy in the next uh, decade is around the quality of care for people with complex needs. Now, whether that's vulnerable families, people with mental health problems, or our many older people with complex, uh, with a mix of complex illnesses. And certainly in the UK, we're already seeing signs of worrying signs that care for uh, particularly frail older people is not as it should be, whether that's care they're receiving at home or in rest homes or indeed in the hospital sector. So putting those two alongside each other, the fact we're not actually going to have as much money to spend on health, but that we have a major challenge in terms of quality of care for our most vulnerable people, my um, argument to, to you this afternoon is that we're going to have to think quite differently about how we deliver care in the future. And it's going to be beyond primary care and secondary care. 
I don't think that model is actually fit for purpose in the future. And we're going to need something quite different, I think, with a, probably a different role for primary care as much more of a, a care manager, a navigator, and working much more clearly um, and in different ways alongside community-based specialists. And I think we may actually have to uncouple quite a lot of our specialists, our consultants, from the hospital uh, buildings and institutions. So how we're going to make all of that happen is probably another, another question, but that's, that's my argument this afternoon. So it's about the money, it's about quality of care for vulnerable people, and then it's about how on earth do we deliver care in a quite different way to meet those needs. Thank you, Judith. Now, our next speaker is the Director of SANT Data Link and a Professor of uh, Public Health at the University of South Australia. Uh, she's also had vast experience in uh, rural medicine and uh, remote medicine. Uh, please welcome uh, Robin McDermott. Robin, your perspective. Thank you. I've, uh, I, first of all, I have to congratulate the organisers and the uh, delegates to this conference. It's been um, uh, really quite inspirational for me, the, uh, the level of engagement, the quality of the discussion, the quality of the presentations. Um, I, uh, I have to thank Graham Miller for this because uh, I've just attended his session and he's talking about polypharmacy in general practice and adverse drug okay. events. And uh, uh, personally, um, it's an issue for me because he mentioned the, uh, the death, the unexpected death of Barbara Starfield um, last year at the age of 80 uh, while she was swimming in, in, uh, in California. And, uh, she, of all people, probably would be the patron saint of, uh, of this gathering here today. Um, she actually died of an iatrogenic illness. So, uh, Judith, it's not just the quality of care for the vulnerable amongst us, it's the quality of care for all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Barbara was uh, taking clopidogrel for, uh, um, for, for a stent operation she had, and she had a, uh, a cerebral haemorrhage as a result of that. So um, actually we're all at risk here. And the other issue that Graham Miller's um, elegant study brought out was uh, the extent of polypharmacy and the extent of medicalisation of um, our current uh, health uh, profile. And um, I think what beautifully complemented that was Paul Glazio's presentation about the relative poverty of the um, non-drug uh, uh, interventions which now populate the evidence base for our so-called EBM and the fact that we have to get better at describing that and characterising that and better at doing it because we've got to get off the drugs, please. Um, a, 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 an amazing statistic was that uh, in the over 50s in the sample from um, Sydney Uni, on average, uh, everyone was taking 4.4 drugs. Unbelievable, every day. So what, challenge number one, let's get ourselves off the drugs and let's get ourselves onto better food and all those things that contribute to uh, what we know is going to improve health overall. So I guess that's my message. By 2020, over 2 million people in this country will have diabetes. And um, diabetes probably is the... Uh, uh, light on the hill as far as if we can get that um, managed properly, then we're doing pretty well in primary care. So far, um, it looks as if we're not doing that well. But uh, the big challenge is to um, stop, the, uh, stop the tsunami. Um, I guess uh, they're the three big things for me. Get off the drugs, get better at um, non-drug interventions, um, get our uh, fabulous primary health care workforce working better together on prevention and um, being able to follow through into population level health outcomes. And we have new technologies now in e-research and with data linkage which can um, make that happen. So I'm looking forward to a future where we can actually um, get much better, quicker uh, feedback about how we're going with our patients in their journey through the healthcare system. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. Next is Professor Claire Jackson. Um, as you are aware, she is a professor, the Professor of General Practice and Primary Health Care um, and the past Head of Discipline at the University of Queensland. And um, Claire, um, over to you. Yes. Well, what's the next 10 years hold for us? I think I'd like to make five points quickly. 
First of all, this is the golden age for primary health care. We've got an international movement behind us. Nothing's going to stop us now. And so for primary health care researchers, we have to have some massive opportunities opening up. The reason primary health care is riding so high is because of the evidence that Barbara and other people collected painstakingly and pushed to policy makers so no one can ignore the critical importance of primary health care, the medical home, many of the other pieces of great research over the last 10 years. The second thing is that the importance of researchers in primary health care reform is very, very clear. And I'd like to thank both David and Mark Booth for the extraordinary commitment they've made over the last three days to us and to working with us at a time that they're frenetically busy with a massive primary health care reform agenda. So that sort of commitment, I think, makes quite clear that we've got a foot in the door. I think as well as push, we need to be pulling. So we need to be looking at good grants, good research, good evidence. But I think we need to be making ourselves available to Mark and David, the department, state government departments, policy makers on an everyday basis. So as they're forming policy, they know they can ring us, ask information, ask for research to be rushed through. And I think that's the way we can meet the timelines that for them are very tight. So what's the best direction in the next 10 years? I think, first of all, ask yourself first and foremost as researchers the so what question. What are the big, hairy questions in primary health care that research needs to be working on now? Look ahead, read through all those primary health care reform documents, uh, look at things like the, co the college's general practice of the future, a really challenging, exciting, visionary, um, and well-integrated primary health care model that the college has spent a lot of time on, has released over the last three months, is on the website, It'll give you a really good inkling as to what questions are out there in the general practice sector, and research is down as a critical um, element in the primary health care general practice of the future. So let's ride that one home. Um, Research in primary care that's quality over the next 10 years will be integrated. So there'll be elements of clinical research, economic research is going to be really important, quality of life, and focus on what consumers and patients need and need to receive, but also on an organisational-based focus, I think will be really important. And success will be linked to real-world application, implementation and acceptability. So we need to make sure the research that we are creating fits well and is well informed by, uh, by the real world. And I think that's been a key theme over the last three days. New models of primary care are certainly well and truly on the agenda. Uh, we've had a fantastic time with the Beacon Practice model at Inala, and that's given us the opportunity to describe a new model, to pilot it, to evaluate it, and to implement it, and work with a bunch of key stakeholders in all of that. Also look for new partners, not just the NHMRC and AFCRI and all the traditional uh, research funders. Let's look at governments, Medicare locals, the private health insurance industry is increasingly having big hairy questions to ask and looking to us to help private organisations. Think about who your research could assist and inform and involve and go looking for a broader focus with your funding. And finally, we're moving into a very volatile and exciting time as researchers. I used to think as a researcher 20 years ago, it was a bit like Joan of Arc, the very pure research methodology and single focus. Now I feel more like Angelina Jolie. I'm leaping off as the healthcare system as I know it explodes underneath me and having to look at reforming my approach, thinking through new opportunities, avoiding dramas in my research. It's very volatile, lots of fun, but very different. So put your ears back and enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Uh, next uh, is another um, GP uh, primary health care provider, and uh, she's also the inaugural chair of primary care research and head of academic centre in general practice and primary health care at the University of Melbourne, Professor Jane Gunn. Thanks, Sally. Um, I think um, many of the challenges have been mentioned, but the thing I would say is that our challenges are shared, well, they should be shared, and that researchers, policy makers, practitioners, Medicare local staff firstly need to know each other because I think that our future is, is really in our people. And I've got um, one request, two challenges and a couple of opportunities to, to put in my few minutes. I think we also have to remember that 
any of us who understand research and the history of research, we know that the best innovations come when we're busy doing other things. You know, that's when the big discoveries come. Um, and so be aware, be on the lookout for the really interesting and innovative things you're finding out. They won't be the things that you've set out to do. Uh, and that's, that's throughout history. I, because um, David's here, I'm going to ask him for more people support for all of you out there, because we do need more research scholarships, we need more postdoctoral fellowships, we need a career structure for primary care researchers. We don't have it yet in this country, and we have lots of great things, but that bit's missing. Um, so what lies ahead? Opportunity number one, personalised medicine. Will it drive reform and cost savings via better targeted treatment, or will it become um, an added on extra for the wealthy? Who of you is researching personalised medicine? Who of, you know, we, I haven't seen abstracts or papers here, and, and certainly it's something that we've got a role in, what will it be? Opportunity number two is the role that primary care is going to play in assessing risk and prognosticating. We will not be doing anywhere near as much as diagnosis and management of, um, of conditions. But um, what will happen here is that we'll be managing risk. But who will we be managing it for? Will it just be increasing health disparities, increasing inequities? When I look into the future, I think we're at really grave risk of creating a two-tiered health system. There'll be the rich, there'll be those of us sitting in this room who have our genes and know our medicines that are best for us and know our risk of this, that and the other. Um, and there'll be those people out in the community that aren't getting it. So what's our role in that? Are we researching it? Are we training our students to be able to be good risk assessors and advisors? Are we educating our population? And are we evaluating it? Um, and just two uh, challenges. One, multimorbidity, and, and Robin said polypharmacy. I think, see, that's the absolutely, I totally agree. We're taught to start medicines, but we're not taught to stop them. Um, what, when, what to cease, how to cease, when to cease, where to cease. And I think one of the things we could see trialled is the idea of a stopping shop. You know, um, where do you, having somewhere where people can go and be taken off their medicines, not in a hospital, not in a, um, you know, place we have to stay, but in, a, in an observed and monitored environment. And my final thing is the other huge challenge is unhappiness. Why are so many people that are living in this country unhappy? What are they unhappy about? But they are, and their unhappiness drives their chronic illness, that drives multimorbidity. The two things are very interlinked. So I think that the multimorbidity and unhappiness are the two giant things that we face, and they should force us to bring health and social care closer together. And that's, I think, one of the huge challenges for Medicare locals. But it could be very distracting if suddenly a whole lot of health researchers go off and try to start integrating with so social and community care. There could be a lot of wasted time. And I leave us with one, you know, we need a grand goal to drive our efforts. Mm -hmm. And Richard Barker, in, 20, in the book that he's um, written called The Future of Medicine 2030, I don't know if you've read it, it's tiny, it's worth a read. Um, perhaps this could be our goal. Every admission to hospital will be seen as our failure to detect, anticipate and intervene early enough. Now, it's not our failure alone. Obviously, the person who gets in hospital is part of it's their problem too. But if us as a system organisers, researchers, clinicians, if we took on the responsibility to think, actually, it's our failure, then that could be our grand goal and that's what we could work together to solve. Empty the hospitals. David. <laughs> Jane, the, uh, the unhappiness, um, I hesitate to say, and I have no evidence for this, but I think a lot of it is actually people feeling guilty because they can't live up to the health expectations that we're telling them they should live up to. Are we actually creating a monster? Um, now, David, uh, I must say, I, 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 it's sad that you are at the end because I always feel it's sad that everyone's had a chance to have a, you know, the, the classic go at the department. I, of course, won't do that because I think the fantastic thing is we are all on the same page. Um, ladies and gentlemen, David Butt is the Deputy Secretary of the Australian Government Department of Health and Ageing. Actually, I thought, Sally, in the context of your positive discrimination, putting me as the token male last <laughs> on the panel was quite appropriate. <laughs> um, 
2020, look, I, I think 2020 brings great opportunity, but it also comes with great risk and uh, a lot of pressure. I mean, we are living in extraordinary times and we're actually quite privileged as leaders in the healthcare system, uh, which as Claire says, I mean, we're in the golden age of primary healthcare. We're also in the golden information age and we are now increasingly able to do things that have never been done before. So I think this is really, we've got unlimited potential. Uh, however, there are, there are major challenges that we're facing and there are issues about demand, about access, about costs, a whole range of issues that we're facing in terms of challenges. And as an example, I reckon by 2020, there'll be a lot of state premiers and treasurers who will be, um, in, their alarm bells will be going through the roof about the ever increasing proportion of their budgets that is being spent on public hospitals and that they won't therefore be able to spend on other things such as education, transport, police and so forth. Um, I think what we're facing is, um, well, they won't be able to unless we do something dramatically different and that's, I guess, what we're all about here uh, today. Uh, I think by 2020, there'll be a combination of factors such as the economic pressures that Judith talked about, uh, market failure, particularly in rural and remote areas, uh, uh, ever-changing technology, and that includes things like home mod monitoring, but also all the new e-health channels that are coming through that are going to enable us to do so many more things remotely, and that then has a flow on into a whole range of areas. Um, the changing disease pat patterns, rise of non-communicable diseases, um, along with, quite frankly, a highly uh, literate community, uh, which is going to be a challenge in itself, which is going to drive changes in models of care, drive changes in funding models, it's going to change the roles and responsibilities of those working within the health sector. Um, it's going to even change things like, um, you know, hospital designs, clinic designs, uh, health service designs generally. Um, 90% of all data that exists in the world today was developed in the last two years. Now, that's a pretty uh, staggering statistic, and what it basically says is that's going to keep on speeding up, and we're going to keep on getting more data. And that, that data, the evidence that it provides, the information that it provides, can't be ignored. Inevitably, it's going to, and it should, uh, drive essential changes in the way we view evidence and the way we use that evidence in relation to whether it's you know, in things like care pathways or guidelines or um, standards that really increasingly um, are going to be required to be ad adhered to. It's also, though, not just about need and clinical pathways, but it will be about customising. I mean, it will be about preference or individualisation of what services we're providing so that we'll know much more about individuals and populations and therefore be able to design services that meet their needs and meet their preferences. Um, and that obviously brings in research. Um, it's derelict if we don't do that, and I think it inevitably um, increases the role and responsibility of the research community, particularly when we get into issues about safety and quality. Um, and what we'll have to do is obviously be very focused on what are we trying to achieve, and therefore what data we need to do we need to achieve those outcomes, uh, and how do we change that data into information and knowledge that is then applied in, in, in a local setting. Um, I think what we'll see is primary healthcare organisations will evolve, gain credibility, capability, uh, competence to take on increasingly broad roles at the local community. And I agree with Judith. Uh, Judith I don't know that um, public hospitals will, will come into primary healthcare organisations, but I think we will be inevitably seeing specialists coming out of public hospitals and working more within the community and more with primary healthcare, uh, more with GPs um, and more, more broadly with the um, team. Um, clinical practice and models of care, uh, I think we're moving from the industrial age, which I had someone recently describe as a very solitary pursuit, to an information age, which is all about teams, about respecting the members of those teams and how they work together, uh, how do you utilise the full scope of practice of individuals working in those teams, or so top of licence if you like. Again, if you're looking at what are we trying to achieve, what the problem, what's the problem we're trying to solve, um, we will need to ensure that incentives, and that's financial incentives and other incentives, are aligned to achieve what we, you know, what we're actually about at the end of the day. So that will actually mean changes in funding models, and that obviously needs a lot of work. And I think um, 
it, it will actually change the way researchers work. I mean, the inflammation flow now and the speed with, it, with which it's going and the way it's speeding up, um, whether it's using social media or you know news or whatever it might be going on, it's, it's so fast that researchers, if you want to be a part of the game, really will need to change the way you work, that you know, writing the occasional academic paper and thinking it's going to actually change the way we implement policy uh, is not going to work. It's actually going to be about how do you engage fast, how do you, how do you be fast and responsive, and how do you actually um, actively participate in the debate not at simple points in the time, but throughout, but throughout the whole process uh, of developing policy and changing practice in Australia. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thanks, panel. You've told us what you think is going to happen, but you didn't tell us how to make sure that we get the answers right. You actually gave us all your view of what's going to happen. I, I seem to remember, I think there was a, a, a candidate for um, the prime ministership back, was it 1987, was it 1985, who said that by 1990 no child will live in poverty, but we've got to do the research, we forgot to put the things in place, we didn't implement it and it still hasn't happened. So I now want to ask you, how do we do it? Now I want to ask you, you can have these answers. You may be sitting in the audience. You may be the Barry Marshall who got up at uh, the World Gastroenterological Conference and said, you're all wrong about the way you treat H. pylori and he got a Nobel Prize. You might get one too. Um, you can tweet your answers. You can write them on pieces of paper. You can put your hand in the air and I'll come around with a microphone. If you put your hand in the air, if you're using the, the old fashioned piece of paper thing, one of our fabulous green people will come and pick it up. Those are the green, pe green people, hands up. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to quote our conference organiser when she said in her brief to me, are we in the full flood of surging tide or the promise of health reform? Or are we stranded in the shallows of reform fatigue? I like that. That's the question I want to pose to you. So for now, we leave our panellists, but the question still lingers on the table for you to consider. How is your 2020 vision? How is the 2020 vision of your workplace? How could you and your workplace do something differently in the intervening years to 2020 so that you can contribute to improved health outcomes in that year and, of course, beyond? You can catch the rest of this session and watch our panellists deliver their key messages on the PICRAS website. Broadly speaking, they see the future in our people and our training and view Medicare locals as a real opportunity to make a difference. We can take advantage of the information age and e-health to get a better picture. Researchers are encouraged to focus on the questions that will make an impact and be ready to be a part of knowledge exchange by engaging in the debate to change policy and practice. This session is just a sample of the quality and the diversity of the interactions between policymakers, researchers and practitioners that characterise the Primary Healthcare Research Conference. The next clip will show you some additional highlights of this conference. It demonstrates the real importance of bringing people together so that they can, can contribute their knowledge, their expertise to enhance our primary healthcare future. Something we pride ourselves on at Picris is we are fluid and flexible. And that is how we are going to handle the next three days because we want you to get the most out of this conference. You're in for three days of stories. Quite a few of you are going to be telling the story of the research that you've done, the findings that you've got and also there's stories to go with the posters. So make sure you go to those poster sessions where the speakers will be standing there and willing to talk to you. And it just gives you so many ideas as to how you can develop your own stories for your own research. This is where the Primary Healthcare Research Conference gives you a convenient and very concentrated opportunity to discuss all things primary healthcare. Australian Primary Healthcare Research Institute here in Canberra have, have shown the way in, in terms of that sort of linkage activity and that real effort and putting resource into thinking how do we commission research differently, how do we link researchers with policy makers in, a, in some different sort of ways and indeed engage with practice in some new ways. We have together a magnificent mix. We have in this room 
the researchers, the policy makers, the administrators, the educators, the practitioners and the consumers. All of you all bring your own perspectives, your knowledge and your skills. But more importantly, we are all on the same side. We are all driven to improve our primary health care and are here to not only talk, but also to listen and to learn from others' perspectives. As medicine grapples with the advancing complexity of knowledge and treatment, uh, Beric argues we need to do two things. Firstly, we need to measure ourselves, and secondly, we need to be more open about what we're doing, because openness drives improvement. And so improving policies and practices requires that we have to be open to new ideas, be willing to try new things to make health outcomes better. And I think the thing that's been really clear over the last five years is that context is a critical part of the rollout and that you can roll out a well-evaluated successful evaluation in drug abuse in youth in New South Wales and it'll have a completely different impact to what it had in the Bronx in, in New York. So I just think you, you need to be very careful about making sure your big hairy questions are relevant to the community that you're wanting to work with. So get out, meet with your Medicare locals as Jane said, meet with your local clinicians meet with your consumers, talk to your policy developers about what the problems are. I think make sure you marry up the time you're spending searching for data with what the big hairy questions are for people of importance in your community. We can close that gap between research and policy so that we can really fulfil what the conference theme is about to influence, inform and implement primary health care at its best. It is important to note that the knowledge exchange continues long after the conference ends. Keynote presentations are webcast and concurrent sessions with synchronised audio and PowerPoint are also uploaded on the PICRIS website. Go to www.picris.org.au for more information.